Now, I've purposely have withheld the title of my sermon this morning because it ties in with the text, and I want you to see that. The title of my message is Visions and Voices. Visions and Voices. Look at verse 1, the phrase, and I looked. There's the vision. And then look at verse 2, and I heard. There's the voice. And then look at verse 6, and I saw. And then look at the opening phrase in verse 13 of chapter 14, and I heard. So we have two things in chapter 14. We see visions. There's six of them. Some say seven, but I believe we have six visions, separate visions, and they're given in anticipation of what is going to happen in the tribulation. And then we have voices as well speaking. The word voice is found seven times between verses 1 and 13. We see it four times alone in verse 2. We see the word once in verse 7. We see it again once in verse 9. Then we see the word once again in verse 13. So I would title chapter 14, Visions and Voices of Prophetic Anticipation. And that's an important word, anticipation. So it's prophetic anticipation of things that will happen or unfold during the time of the tribulation. So chapter 14 is a series of six visions and voices that are unfolding. Now, in contrast, chapter 14 to chapter 13 opens up with a beast coming out of the sea who is none other than the Antichrist. He has ten horns, he has crowns, he has ten heads, seven horns, crowns upon his horns, and he speaks blasphemy. And then we have a second beast, which is the false prophet, and he as well brings a false religious system in and leads people astray. But as you open up chapter 14, it's like a breath of fresh air. John says, I saw, and lo, the Lamb stood on Mount Zion. So we go from the beast to the Lamb of God standing victoriously on Mount Zion. Zion. So chapter 13 is a parenthetical section as well. And this is very, very important for you to understand. I've been emphasizing it all morning, and please listen to me carefully. From chapter 10 to chapter 15, we have what's called a parenthetical section of the book of Revelation. Now, what we mean by that is that it's not chronological. And it's not unfolding in chronological order, sequential order. So there's a pause, and you go in depth, and you talk about people and events and things that happen in the tribulation. So some of these things go back, some of them go forward, but they're in-depth information. When we have a parenthesis and a sentence, we're filling in information, we're giving more information. So it's a parenthesis to tell us more about people and places and events that take place. Someone described chapter 14 as like an, a lot like an appendix to a, or a table of context, excuse me, to a book where we learn what's in the book, we learn what's going to happen before we get there. So the visions and the voices describe what is yet future, and that's picked up in chapter 16 as you move through the book of Revelation, and we're dealing with that as we go through and outline the book. But today we're going to look just at the first five of six visions and voices that proclaim and announce that Christ is coming in victory. The first is, if you're taking notes, write it down, the vision of the 144,000 on Mount Zion, and it's in verses 1 to 5. Now, I really want you to get this outline. Verses 1 to 5 is the future prophetic anticipation vision of the 144,000 standing victoriously on Mount Zion. Let's read it, verse 1. John says, And I looked. So we have a vision. And lo, in the Greek it would be, The Lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having their father's name written in their foreheads. And now I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and the voice of great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping, with their harps. And they sang, as it were, verse 3, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts or living creatures and the elders. 
And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Verse 4. And these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whether, wherever he goes. These are they who are redeemed from among men, and they are the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Verse 5. And in their mouth there was no guile. They are without fault before the throne of God. Now, we could do a whole sermon on these verses this morning, and part of me wanted to do that, but I don't want to get too bogged down in the details that we missed the whole theme of the book of Revelation. But let me go back and unpack some important points in these first five verses. First, we see the Savior in verse 1. John says, And I looked, and lo, the Lamb. My King James Bible has a lamb, but it's better rendered the Lamb. And I believe it's very clear to any Bible student that this is none other than Jesus Christ, right? He is the Lamb of God. John the Baptist pointed at Jesus and said, Look, behold, the Lamb of God who carries away the sins of the world. And I love that picture. So Jesus is a fulfillment of all the sacrificial lambs offered in the Old Testament. He, they are the type, he is the anti-type, the fulfillment of that which was pictured in type. So all the animals that were sacrificed were the picture of Jesus' death on the cross. So we open up this heavenly scene, and I do believe it's a heavenly scene, with the Lamb of God on the Mount Zion. Jesus the Lamb. Now again, it's a contrast to chapter 13, verse 1, where we see the beast coming out of the sea. Now, notice, secondly, the site or the location of this vision, verse 1, stood on Mount Zion. Now, there's two ways to interpret this concept of Mount Zion. One is literally that they're physically on earth and that they're in Jerusalem, and the temple that was built there was on Mount Zion. Again, if you know your Bible, you know that the temple of Jerusalem had been built on a mountain, and it was called Mount Zion. This is why whenever you read of people going to Jerusalem, they're always ascending. From any direction, north, south, east, west, when you go to Jerusalem, you're always in ascent because it's high up on a mountain. The second view is, and if it's the first view that it's the physical Mount Zion in Jerusalem, then perhaps this is a picture of what happens after the second coming during the millennium of the kingdom age. But a more plausible view, and I think it's consistent with the rest of the text, is that it's talking about heaven. In the book of Hebrews, it actually uses the concept of heaven, Hebrews 12, verse 22, in reference to being Zion, or heaven being referred to as Mount Zion. So it seems to me, and I could be wrong, that this is actually a vision of the 144,000 standing now victorious after having endured all the difficulties of the tribulation period, and now they're victorious in the heavenly scene. Doesn't give us the detail of how they get from earth to heaven. Doesn't tell us when all that happens. But most likely after the second coming, they are taken to heaven, be with the Lord. So they are the 144,000 in the heavenly scene. Now notice they're sealed, verse 1. He says, there are 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now again, I do believe, and I keep giving you the two kind of views, but I should just tell you what I think and get right to the point, is that some think that this 144,000 are the different group than the 144,000 in chapter 7. But I don't believe that. I believe it's the same group, same number, and many parallels between the two that they're sealed in their foreheads with their father's name. So this 144,000 verse 1 is the same group that's sealed from 12 tribes, their Jewish believers, back in chapter 7. But notice the song that they sing in verse 2, or that they are singing in heaven, verses 2 and 3. And I heard a voice from heaven, verse 2, as the voice of many waters and as the voice of great thunder, and I heard voices of harpers harping with their harps. And what they were doing was singing 
as it were, a new song. And notice we're at before the throne, which would support the idea that they're actually in the heavenly scene. And before the four beasts, which are the four living creatures, and the elders, which I think are the 24 elders that represent the church, he says, no man could learn that song but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. So they're in heaven, they're around the throne, they're worshiping God. They are the 144,000 who are sealed in chapter 7. But their song is that of worshiping around the throne. Now, a point I want to make before I move on is that they had suffered the sorrows of the tribulation, but God had turned their sorrows into songs. Someone said the sweetest songs are the fruit of sorrow. The sweetest songs are the fruit of sorrow. You know, if you want to really smell a rose, try it sometime. Crush it in your hand. And when you open your hand, the fragrance will just come out from that rose. And so many times when God wants his fragrance to flow from our lives, he crushes us. He doesn't hurt us. He's got a purpose and plan. He wants his fragrance to flow through our life. So he takes these who went through the tribulation and were persecuted and suffered, though they were protected by God, and now he gives them a song that is all their own. No one else can learn it. No one else knows it. It's going to be the song in heaven of the 144,000. Let me say this too before I move on. There's going to be a lot of singing in heaven. And I say that because I've had people say, well, I went to your church and I like it and sermon was fine and everything, but you sing too much. <laughs> we sing too much, really. Well, then you're not going to be very happy when you get to heaven. You're going to go, oh, no, this is like Revival Christian Fellowship. <laughs> and not only that, King David will be there. We, we heard the harps. He's going to have his harp plugged into a Fender amplifier. <laughs> and he's going to be jamming on it. It's going to be amazing. And we're going to be singing. We're going to be worshiping. I love that stanza, John Newton's Amazing Grace, when we've been there 10,000 years. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Amen? So we're going to be singing and praising and worshiping the Lord, which these 144,000 were doing, and they're glorifying Him. What a marvelous thing that is. And then I got one more important point before I move to my second in verse 6 and 7. And that is, back in chapter 7, 144,000 Jews were sealed. That's somewhere at the beginning of the tribulation. Now, they've gone through the tribulation. They're not the church, by the way. We're raptured before the tribulation starts. They are in heaven. How many made it safely to heaven? 144,000. Duh. I studied all week to figure that out. <laughs> he started with 144,000. And he ended with 144,000. You say, well, what's your point, preacher boy? My point is the good shepherd never loses a sheep, amen? He leaves the 90 and 9, and he goes into the wilderness. He funds, finds the one sheep that is lost. He puts it on his shoulders, and he brings it back rejoicing. So how wonderful that it speaks of his security. So he seals them, and he secures them, and he keeps them and takes them safely home to heaven. This is why the book of Romans in chapter 8 says, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Not height nor depth nor any other creature. Not life nor death nor sword or peril. It opens with, there's no condemnation. It closes with, there's no separation. Read the book of Jude, verse 24, where Jude says, now in his closing benediction of his little one chapter epistle, he says, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. And to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So he had 144,000 and he ended with 144,000. How, how would it be if you read this and said, and there were 100, no, no, wait, wait, bummer, bummer. There's only 141. We lost a few. So if you begin with grace, it will end in glory. But notice fifthly and lastly, their sanctification 
in verses 4 and 5. I forgot to point that out. They are called virgins, and I believe that spiritually. They didn't worship the beast or his image or take his mark. They had not turned to false religions or idolatry. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, he said, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin unto Christ. So this virginity is actually referring to, spiritually speaking, they were not adulterated by turning away from God. They were worshiping God completely and totally. And then they followed Christ, verse 14, and they went wherever he went. And then in verse 4, uh, verse 4, not verse 14, excuse me, they are redeemed first fruits. Notice that in verse 4, they are redeemed and their first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. So redemption is God purchasing us by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. You know, if you're a Christian, you're bought, you're redeemed, you're bought out of slavery, you belong to God and he set you free, and that you are the first fruits unto God. Now, in the Old Testament, they had the feast of first fruits. And what that was, was when they would in gather the harvest, before they would reap the whole field, they would take a corner of the wheat and they would take it out of the field and they would wave it before the Lord and they would put it on the altar and they would give it to God. So the harvest was first given to God as recognition that it all comes from God, it all belongs to God. So that first fruits is symbolic of the believer uh, that you consecrate, you dedicate your life to God. And it could indicate that the 144,000 were the first to be saved in the tribulation period, and they are dedicated unto God. So they are blameless also, verse 5, notice that, as they stand before the throne. So they're found no guile, they're without fault before the throne of God. You know that's true of you and I right now in Christ? So many Christians beat themselves up and go, I'm not worthy, I'm such a bad Christian, I'm not a good person. And they forget you're a sinner saved by grace. Now, let me, let me use a couple of terms that you need to understand. I can't preach on them, but I want to mention them. When you get saved, you are first of all positionally, there's the word, positionally in Christ, perfectly righteous. That's what's known as justification, which is the act of God whereby he declares the believing sinner to be righteous based on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Now, you can't improve on that. You can't grow into that. You instantaneously, the moment you are saved, stand in Christ perfectly righteous before a holy God. How can a man be right with God? The answer is by faith, not by works. So the next word is called imputation where God takes the righteousness of Christ and he imputes it to your account. Like in, it's a banking term. It's a term for banking. If you had a bank account and it went down to almost zero and someone with a lot of money deposited money in your account, in your behalf, that's called the imputed. They put money in your account. So we stand bank, we stand, we stand broke and we stand bankrupt before a holy God. And then at the cross, when we believe in Jesus, he takes the righteousness of Christ and he deposits it in our account. And we're standing perfectly righteous. That's your position. But sanctification is the process that begins at justification, and it's a lifelong process. That's your practice. So you go from your position, perfectly righteous, never changes, never can be lost, to your practice, sanctification, which is a lifelong process whereby by his spirit, through his word, through trials and troubles, he's making you, shaping you, fashioning you to be more like Christ. The goal of sanctification is likeness to Christ. It won't be completely obtained until you get to heaven. That's the third phase of salvation. It's called glorification. So you're justified positionally. You're being sanctified practically. 
and then you will be glorified when you get to heaven completely or totally. No more sin. Praise the Lord. Amen. You'll be done with this earthly body of sin and you'll be in the presence of the Lord where you won't have sin or sickness or sorrow or weakness or memory loss. No more cancer, disease, and the list could go on. We'll be glorified in heaven. And I mention all that because they are, verse 5, faultless standing before the throne. In the book of Jude, he's able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless. Verse 6 and 7 is the second vision. It's the vision of the gospel preaching angel. We're going to have three angels. Here's angel number one. He's the gospel preaching angel who will preach the gospel during the tribulation, probably the last half, just before the second coming, calling people to turn to God. Notice in verse 6 and 7. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. There it is. And he was preaching to them that dwell on the earth, not only in Israel, but every nation, every kindred, every tongue, and every people. The word nation is the Greek word ethnos. We get our word ethnic from it. So all ethnic groups. Saying, verse 7, with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to Him, for, here's the reason, the hour of His judgment is come. Now, I thought that's interesting. We're glorifying God because the hour of His judgment is come. And then the third point in the angel's message, worship Him, verse 7, that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. Now, for the first time in history, note that, an angel is going to be allowed to preach the gospel. And you say, well, why is that? Because God has entrusted the gospel to human beings, not angels. Angels are curious. They look into our salvation, Peter tells us. And they're amazed. They scratch their head like, why would God bother with these flaky human beings? Why would God send his son to become one of them, to redeem them? They're just in awe of God's redemptive plan. But they can't preach. Let me give you an example. In Acts chapter 10, there was a Gentile. He was a Roman soldier. His name was Cornelius. And he was a devout man, probably wanting to try to find salvation through Judaism. And he was fasting and praying and seeking God. God sent an angel to him. But the angel didn't share the gospel. The angel told him, you need to go to Joppa, which is the seaport village, and you need to find this guy named Peter. So Simon Peter. And you need to tell him that you've seen an angel, and the angel said to come get him, and to come to your house, and to tell you all the words of life. So the angel, instead of preaching, now if I were Cornelius, then why don't you just tell me? Why do I need to go find Peter hanging out on a housetop somewhere in Joppa? Why don't you just tell me? Because angels weren't given that privilege of preaching the gospel. So they send a messenger, servant. They find Simon Peter. God had prepared his heart on the the top of the house to go to the Gentiles. And so he goes to the Gentiles, which is kind of funny. He shows up at this Gentile house. He goes, well, you guys all know that I'm not supposed to be here. And uh, you're all unclean. But God told me to come, so here I am. What do you want? That's a real enthusiastic preacher. So pre-Peter starts telling them, and they all get saved. It's the first time Gentiles come in mass to believe in Jesus Christ. But the point I wanted to make was the angel doesn't preach the gospel. Now, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, I want you to write that down. Matthew 24, verse Verse 14, Jesus in his Olivet Discourse, describing what will happen before the second coming and the end of the age, said this gospel shall be preached into what? All the world, and then shall the end come. Now the church for years is, I believe, perhaps misinterpreted that, and they thought, you know, the Lord can't come back until every language group, every people group, every hidden tribe hears the gospel. Now, should we go into all the world and preach the gospel? Yes. But Jesus isn't looking at his watch, tapping his foot like, come on, guys, hurry up. I want to come back. Get the gospel to all the world. 
Because I believe that he's going to do that through the angel during the tribulation and that that's what Jesus could be referring to, what we just read in the book of Revelation, that the gospel will be preached into all the world, then shall the end, the second coming come. Now that's not to say we shouldn't be motivated to preach the gospel to the whole world. He gave us the great commission. But it could be that Jesus was alluding to that in Matthew 24 and verse 14. Now, it's interesting that this angel, verse 6, flies in the midst of heaven. The very word used for heaven indicates where the sun or the moon would stop straight up over the earth so that the largest portion of people could see that. So it's possible that this angel just hovers in the upper atmosphere, and as the earth turns in the 24-hour cycle, everyone sees this angel. I don't know if he has an angelic megaphone or what. I'm sure his voice is plenty loud to be heard. He's preaching the everlasting gospel. What is that? It's the gospel. There's only one gospel. One of the things we're learning on Wednesday night in the book of Galatians, there is no other gospel. Paul even said in Galatians, if I or we preach any other gospel, even an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than that which we've preached to you, let him be what? Accursed, anathema, cursed to the lowest hell. So there's only one gospel, and that gospel is that Jesus came from heaven, the second person of the Godhead, took on humanity, lived a sinless life, that he died for our sins on the cross. So the gospel is the good news, Jesus paid for your sins. Jesus was buried, Jesus rose again, and by faith in Jesus Christ, you can be saved. That is the good news. And that's what these angels, or this angel, no doubt, is going to be preaching this everlasting gospel and the fact that it doesn't change and that it's universal. Notice verse 6, every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Same gospel for every culture. It's not gospel for the Western world, gospel for the Eastern world, gospel for Africa. One gospel for the entire world. And then notice what this angel said. Fear God, verse 7. Give glory to God, verse 7. And then verse 7, worship God. So he had three points to his message. Fear God, give glory to God, and worship God. Now, one of the problems in our culture today, and we'll say this and move on, is that we've lost our fear of God. And we're going to see in this text that it doesn't help that we've taught evolution. So we have no need for God. It was just a big bang, and we just all evolved. There was no creator. So you take God out of the equation, there's no fixed point. There's no absolute authority. Whatever you want to believe, you can believe. And it may be only right because it's advantageous to you socially to get along with people, but there's no absolute truth. There's no fixed point for absolute truth. So it's all relative. So if you don't believe in God, how can you say that there's any real moral standard that you can be sure about. So there's no fear of God. We've denied the existence of God. We don't give glory to God. And therefore, God gives the culture up, Romans chapter 1, to a reprobate mind. They get rid of God. They degenerate and go down. When you take God out of the equation, there's only one way to go, and that's down. You know the word reprobate mind? The word reprobate means does not work. I'm always looking at what's going on in our culture, especially in America right now. I'm thinking, these minds don't work anymore. These people are reprobate. It's completely insane. And that's because they've rejected God. They've rejected his word. Now, notice at the end there of verse 7, he says there, worship God that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. The Bible does not teach evolution. Evolution is a lie from the pit of hell. The idea that there was a big bang and we just all evolved. You don't even have to go to science to prove the fallacy of evolution. The Bible is very clear. Either you believe God or you believe man. In the beginning, God. Either you believe that some form of matter, time, space, energy must have existed for What caused the bang to bang? What banged? 
Where did it come from? What's the origin of matter? What's the origin of time and space and energy? What caused all that? There must be a greater cause. It's God. Either you believe in an eternal, all-existent God, or you believe in some form of eternal, all-existent matter. And either one, you take them by faith. What makes more sense? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So you were made by God. And I love it. It says he made the heavens, he made the earth, he made the sea, I love that, and the fountains of waters. In Psalm, 1, Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. Day unto day they utter their speech. It's a revelation of God's existence. The Bible is a revelation of God's existence. It's the Word of God. And the Son of God, Jesus, the living Word, is a revelation of God as well. Born of a virgin, performed miracles, rose from the dead, and ascended back into heaven. But the Bible does not teach that we are the product of evolution. Let me give you vision number three. We'll move on. Verse eight, one verse. This is the fall of Babylon predicted and prophesied in verse eight. He said, there followed another angelos, another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. The great city because she that is Babylon made all nations to drink the wine of the wrath of her foreign occasion. I believe, again, this is spiritual or material fornication, turning from God to materialism. So this voice of prophetic anticipation is repeated twice. Is fallen, is fallen for emphasis and to indicate the certainty of the fall of Babylon. Now, when we get to Revelation 17... We're going to have the fall of religious Babylon. When we get to Revelation chapter 18, we're going to have the fall of commercial Babylon. So if you wanted to today, you could go home and read those two chapters and you'll get the insight of what this is predicting. Religious Babylon falls in chapter 17. Commercial Babylon falls in chapter 18. But what does Babylon represent? Well, there was an actual place or city called Babylon nation of Babylon, but it represents Satan's rebellion and opposition and war against God and God's people. It represents the satanically empowered false religions of the world and God's attack against God's people. Now, notice the reason for Babylon's destruction in verse 8, because they made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This is spiritual fornication. So it's the introduction of false religions and the introduction of materialism. There's no life beyond the grave. There is no God. Man is a material being only. There's no eternal spirit in man. You die and go back to the earth and that's it. It's a lie from Satan. So all of this is going to be destroyed by God in Satan's opposition. Jesus will triumph over Satan's evil systems, chapter 17 and 18. But let me give you the fourth vision in verse 9 to verse 12. This is the vision of the voice of judgment on the beast worshipers. Now again, remember, this is parenthetical. This isn't the sequence of events. But in the end, God is going to judge these who worship the beast and take his image and his mark to worship him. Verse 9, the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice. So this is the fourth judgment or vision. He says, if any man worship the beast, this is again the false prophet in his image, and receive his mark in their forehead or on their hand, the same, that is those who worship the beast, worship his image, Receive the mark of the beast, chapter 13, number of a man, 666. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Now, notice the statement there in your Bible, the wrath of God. A lot of people like to deny the idea that God would ever judge sin or the wicked, which is poured out without mixture. Now, here's a graphic description of hell which is the cup of his indignation 
and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone or sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke, verse 11, of their torment shall ascend forever and ever. They have no rest day or night who worship the beast nor his image or whosoever receives the mark of his name. Now stop right there for just a moment because in verses 9 to 11, you have this prediction of this judgment upon those who worship the beast. But the point is, is that God will judge sin. So the people that are doomed in verse 9 are those who worship the beast. They are unsaved. They're not Christians. They're not a part of the church. They're not believers who are in Christ. They're safe and secure in heaven. Their punishment is hell. The Bible teaches the existence of a real, literal hell. Some facts about hell. In Matthew 25, verse 41, Jesus said, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, into everlasting fire, prepared for Satan and his angels. So God doesn't send anyone to hell. You go there if you reject Jesus Christ. So all you have to do to go to hell is nothing. Don't believe in Jesus. Don't repent of your sins. Don't put your faith in Christ. You're born in sin, separated from God. You're on the road to destruction. You're on the road to hell. If you're not a Christian, you're on the road to hell. Now, I hear these crazy people that say, well, if I go to hell, all my friends will be there. We're going to party. We're going to play poker. We're going to have a great time. It's going to be wonderful. No, it's not. Jesus talked more about hell than anyone else. He said, the fire's never quenched. He said, there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. He said, it's a place of outer darkness. Jesus knew of the dangers of hell and warned us. Hell is a place, verse 10 and verse 11, of torments. It's a place that is eternal, verse 11. And it's a place where, verse 11, there is no rest. So you don't want to go to hell. You say, what do I have to do not to go to hell? You need to repent. You need to change your mind about your sin, turn around and believe in Jesus Christ. So notice the closing encouragement of the perseverance of the saints, verse 12. Here is the patience. The word is perseverance of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, the fact that they kept God's commandments is because they trusted in Jesus by faith, and they're saved. Don't twist this around and say, look at, in order to be saved, you got to keep God's commandments because we're saved by grace through faith. You don't add any works to salvation. But once you are saved by faith, you keep God's commandments as evidence that you are a child of God. But what this is in verse 12 is a word of encouragement that the saints in the tribulation period, not the church, but tribulation saints, will persevere knowing that judgment is coming upon the wicked at this time. That their suffering is only temporary, not eternal. Now, fifthly and lastly, verse 13 is our last vision, our voice. And it's the voice of blessing on those who die in the Lord. Verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, right. So he heard this voice. John wrote it down. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, the spirit saith that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Now I'm closing, not going into the sixth vision. Blessed are they who die in the Lord. Now you're saying, blessed are they who die? I I don't get this. You've already kind of freaked me out because you talked about the wrath of God. Now you're saying people who die are blessed in the Lord. You know, the Bible says blessed or precious is the death of God of God's saints. You know when a Christian dies? It's time to celebrate. Amen? If John Miller dies, I don't want you crying for me. Cry for yourself. You're still stuck in Menifee. (laughs) 
I'm going to be in heaven praising God. Don't pray me back either. I'll be mad at you. (laughs) You know where a Christian goes when they die? Immediately into the presence of Jesus Christ. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, to be absent from the body is to be what? (coughs) Present with the Lord. Paul said to the Philippians, he said, for me to live is what? Christ. And to die is gain. How glorious is that? I once heard somebody say, I never forgot it, you're not ready to live until you're ready to die. Until you're ready to die, you're not ready to live. You're going to be living in fear, the fear of death. Jesus conquered sin, conquered death, conquered the grave. And when you're a born-again child of God, you don't need to fear death because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So blessed. Now, this is the second beatitude of seven beatitudes in the book of Revelation. There are actually seven beatitudes in the book. The first is chapter 1, verse 3. We said, blessed are those who read, those who hear, and those that keep the prophecies of this book. So if you just come on Sunday, you read the book together, and you hear and you obey, you're blessed. But if you're a child of God, for you to die means you only move to your new permanent home in heaven. What a glorious prospect that is. But the opposite, when you are not a Christian, when a Christian, when a non-Christian dies, the Bible is very clear that you go immediately to hell. We just read about it in this text. Jesus described it in pretty graphic detail in Luke chapter 16. He said there was a rich man and a man that was poor named Lazarus. He said the rich man died and went to hell. The poor man Lazarus died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. He went to the place of paradise. Now this is kind of an Old Testament description of where people go when they die. You either go to torment or you go to paradise. So is the case today. Now, at the end of the book of Revelation, we're going to actually see this place called Hades, or hell in your English Bible, New Testament, that all the wicked dead that are waiting there will be resurrected at the end of the thousand-year millennium, and they will stand before the great white throne judgment. Books will be opened, their names will not appear, and they'll be thrown into a second death. It's called the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, which is in the Greek the word Gehenna, So Hades gives up the dead, they're resurrected, stand before God, their names are not in the book of life, and then they're cast into the lake of fire, where the beast and the false prophet and the devil will be forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. You don't want to go there. Two options, heaven or hell. If you'll repent of your sin and believe in Jesus Christ, you can have the hope of heaven in your heart. You can know your sins are forgiven. You can know that when you die, you'll go to heaven. You say, what do I need to do? Admit you are a sinner, that you fall short of God's standards, that no one is righteous, no, not one. Admit that Jesus Christ came from heaven to pay the penalty of your sins on the cross, and that he paid for it in full and rose victoriously from the grave, and then receive by faith Jesus Christ and be saved. If God has spoken to you through this message today and you're not sure that you're a child of God, maybe you don't know for sure that if you died today that you would go to heaven, you've never really trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I would like to lead you in a prayer right now, inviting Christ to come into your heart and to be your Savior. So as I pray this prayer, I want you to repeat it out loud right where you are after me. Make it from your heart, inviting Christ to come in and be your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I pray that you'll forgive me and come into my heart and make me your child. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to live for you all the days of my life. I believe in you. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, God heard that prayer, and I believe that God will and does forgive your sins. We'd like to help you get started growing in your walk and relationship with Jesus Christ. God bless you.
If you just prayed with Pastor John to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we are so excited for you. And we'd like to send you a Bible and some resources to get you started in your relationship with the Lord. Simply click on the contact link at the top of the page and tell us something like, I prayed to accept Christ. We'll get your Bible and resources mailed out to you right away. God bless you and welcome to the family of God.